Uh, gentlemen, if I could start with you, Kay. Um, you know, when people voted just, just a, a minute ago, they, they didn't put management skills or technological skills too high there, um, both of which are part of entrepreneurship. And why is, what do you think of entrepreneurship being and why is it so important? Without any exception, the innovation is the engine of growth, key to the successful development. And for uh, innovation, entrepreneurship is absolutely needed. And for us, entrepreneurship refers to the capacity to put new ideas into practice. But also, the capacity to manage enterprise operation effectively. And in our observations, manage, poor management is... We have a picture here, really please. This is one of Tetsushi's pictures. Please, could we have the picture of the two people at the lathe? Mm -hmm. There we go. Yes, uh, this is a good example. Uh, this workshop received very big job. So everybody must be very busy, but only one person is working. The one person is just watching, another person is hiding. The third person you can see on the, on the, on the right. <laughs> so this is a really terrible situation. Another case may be shown by the next uh, the, the next picture of the stacks. There we go. Yeah, this must be, uh, you know, th this is the, the, the factory, garment factory in Vietnam. Everything should be in set in the uh, right place. This is... You get a big get order for white t-shirts and how do you find them, <laughs> right? Yeah, it takes a lot of time to find out the right thing. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so, so entrepreneurship is important. And but in how does entrepreneurship... Tell me a little bit about how this fits into entrepreneurship. This is, this is a management skill, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but management is very important to realize innovations. Uh, New product may be produced, but in order to produce new product, one, one has to develop new markets. And one has to control the quality, one has to order the uh, parts to uh, parts suppliers. Management is absolutely needed to realize... The Holistic. So, 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 yeah, so on, not only technology, but management is very, very important. Are there any success stories you can use as an illustration? Yes, I have the favorite story of the uh, garment industry in Bangladesh. In 1979, there was no garment factory in Bangladesh. But the company of the South uh, Korea had decided to produce uh, garment products in, in Bangladesh in collaboration with the Bangladesh company. But there was no skilled worker, no experienced manager. So the Deu company has decided to invite 130 young newly recruited workers for training. Uh, from sewing to uh, managing, uh, quality control, marketing, exporting, etc. And after eight months, 130 people returned to, uh, to Bangladesh. But in a, th in a few years, all those 130 people decided to quit the job. And they established uh, new businesses. And then those workers working for these 130 companies also quitted the jobs. And then they created a new one. In this way, huge industrial cluster is formed. And as a result, now, there are more than 5,000 companies, or thousand, more than 5,000 entrepreneurs. On the average, they employ more than 700 workers. So altogether, 4 million jobs were created. So that, that's a remarkable story of the importance of learning from abroad about management and technology. Can it be replicated? Of course, but we should not expect the company of South uh, Korea to repeat the same mistake in other countries. Because <laughs> it was a mistake for them, but yeah, very yeah, yeah, good yeah. for Bangladesh. That is why we need the support from the government, international organizations, or from uh, bilateral, bilateral donors. But the importance of learning from abroad is true also in Africa. That's a very good example. That is an example of the uh, sh leather shoe industry in, in Ethiopia, which has been growing pretty well because it has been learning a lot from Italy. Okay. Well, Tetsushi, you've, you've been spending a lot of time, um, and obviously uh, business management is a, a global endeavor, and everybody has their own ideas about it, but what, how are you using it in, in um, sub-Saharan Africa? Okay, so in order to see the, if the management training really works, uh, because uh, it, it must be very important, but uh, still uh, there is a question whether or not we can teach whether or not they want to learn. So we have been conducting a kind of experiment. So our training program consists of the, uh, teaching about uh, uh, entrepreneurship spirit, 
um, mark, very uh, basic knowledge of marketing and uh, business planning and the importance of record keeping. Uh, not uh, advanced training about rec uh, record keeping, but just importance of the keep, uh, record keeping. And also a very basic knowledge of Kaizen, uh, like a uh, uh, very simple one, housekeeping, uh, in order to avoid this kind of messy storage. And then uh, we conducted the surveys of the participants and non-participants before and after the training and to compare. And then we randomized the invitation to the uh, training program. So, so is that the story uh, of Ghana? Yeah, uh, in Ghana, uh, please show the next slide. Next uh, slide, in, please, there we go. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks to the John Page's uh, financial support, <laughs> he brought some money for, from the World Bank, so we could uh, provide this training to uh, the metal working people in Kumasi, the second largest city in Ghana. I'm going to just interrupt you for a minute, because tell us how there mm. came to be such a huge cluster of metal workers in Kumasi. Oh, uh, in Kumasi, uh, there is a huge cluster of the uh, automobile repairers. Because in the developed countries, the car owners are you know, scattered, so the service providers are also scattered. But in Ghana, most cars are trucks, and then the Kumasi is along the very important road. Uh, connecting the, the seaport to the inland. So th there's a huge demand for car repairing, truck repairing. So there's a, um, more than 10,000 hmm? 10, masters of car repairers. The, 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 uh, that cluster is known to the other countries, like Mali and the next, next country. So basically, your truck go breaks down, you uh, head for Kumasi. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it? then yeah. I don't know how can they bring those broken cars from the next, next country, but yeah. somehow <laughs> some masters are so well known in the West Africa. And so they are rich, although their clothes are very dirty, but they are rich people. So many people, young people want to be like them, so they come as uh, apprentices. And then there is a huge demand for the, you know, uh, ma lead machine turners and those uh, uh, skills. So then metalworking uh, clusters also emerged. And then we provide, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, recently, the, those engine blocks are imported from uh, Asia. Mm -hmm. So rather than repairing, then they are now just uh, replace the engine itself. Ah. So the demand for this skill, uh, the skilled people are declining. So th please show the next slide. Next slide, please. <coughs> the profitability, uh, okay, this is a messy uh, workshop and which can be uh, turned into the better one after the Kaizen training. So please yeah. show the next one. Um, okay, okay, I've got okay. to interrupt you one minute. Mm -hmm. Can you please explain the difference between <coughs> Kaizen training uh -huh. and the traditional BDS training? Uh, BDS Just for those of us, I mean, there may be somebody else besides me who wasn't aware of the difference. Um, so very briefly. Okay, so uh, Kaizen is more about the housekeeping and then the, uh, encouraging the workers, everybody, uh, not just the managers, but the workers, to participate and think and then practice how to improve the productivity. So initially, they just uh, clean up and then sort out important things and unimportant things. But then they find, oh, the uh, you know, working environment is becoming better. So they are happy. So they think more and to improve the uh, workplace. So that's Kaizen. All right. So very human friendly. And then please show the next slide. So in the Ghana, uh, that metal working cluster, the profitability has been declining because of the cheap uh, imports from Asia. And then we, pro uh, because uh, the red, uh, red one, a uh, pink one is a non-participant, and then blue or green is uh, a uh, participant. So we randomize uh, uh, part, uh, you know, invitation. So they are almost the same. But okay. after the training, training was provided uh, toward the end of 2007. Then one year later, we visited the same place and then interviewed and then collected data. Then the profitability uh, you know, de uh, increased for the participant, but uh, for non participant, <coughs> unfortunately, profitability has been declining. And then uh, one more very important finding from this case is that uh, uh, why the part, uh, non participants, many pa non participants stopped the operation uh, after one year of the, uh, in the 2008, but uh, among the participants, none uh, has uh, closed down. 
Ah, so very good very rate of important. success. They yeah. survived. So the survival rate in, uh, increased. So uh, the months and the John Page emphasized uh, the, those short uh, uh, lived uh, enterprises are problematic. But uh, after training, so after good training, so small enterprises can be uh, very good uh, employment creators. So this is the business equivalent of CPR, mm -hmm. <laughs> moving things on. And now what about Kenya? Because you had a slightly different case in Kenya, uh, didn't Yeah, in, in Kenya, uh, please show the next slide. This is a really informal cluster of metalworking people, very dirty place. And uh, so for this is a non-participant. Uh, uh, pink, pink shows uh, sales revenue and uh, uh, orange shows uh, gross profit. And then uh, in a similar These are the non-participants. Non-participants. Okay. And then here, the timing was very bad for our uh, experiment because it was just after the uh, uh, post election violence. Ah. So it was very dangerous. So we couldn't provide training at night time, but uh, we have to provide it uh, during the daytime. Then uh, the you know, relatively successful businessmen were very busy. So they couldn't participate. So our participants in this case were all small ones. So we couldn't randomize the invitation. We just, just allowed everybody. Yeah, everybody. And then the relatively small one came. So please show it. OK. So for small ones, both the sales revenue and the uh, profit were lower initially. But uh, after uh, the training, which was provided in the early 2008, so the small one catch up or even uh, yes. perform better than the uh, non-participants. This uh, happened only six months after the training program. And that's, that's a pretty short time to actually mm -hmm. measure, isn't and it? And also an important finding from this uh, case is that uh, some of the participants moved from that informal cluster to the formal, formal sector industrial zones. So Maybe. the issues that we were raising about tax before, this is showing a Yeah, they, they were really harassed by those uh, government <laughs> officials uh, almost daily. But uh, uh, after training, they gained kind of self-confidence. So they moved to the industrial zone. So it became formalized. formalized. And, and then, I, I guess finally it was Tanzania, wasn't it? Yeah, please show the next slide. And in Tanzania, uh, Dar es Salaam, uh, we provided uh, similar training to the government. Uh, producers. Uh, they are producing not just the dress, but uh, also the bathroom furnishings and the bags and those things. And then 80% uh, of the participants, uh, no, no, uh, the cluster people are mm, female entrepreneurs. And then many of them started the businesses after receiving training from the UNIDO, uh, which was provided for the female uh, potential entrepreneur exclusively, so males are uh, excluded. <coughs> so uh, the female perform very, uh, female uh, entrepreneurs perform very well. So the left hand side uh, about the annual profit before the training, uh, the biggest one uh, male, male uh, entrepreneurs perform better, but uh, except the, the, those uh, largest one, female and largest, male largest then the average uh, profit is, was about the same. Mm. Well, the female was slightly better. And also, we have kind of the indicator uh, of the management skill, which uh, we call management score. So uh, before the training. So, so basically, the men were kind of catching up, do you think? Right. Yes. Because so, they had, hadn't mm, had the skills that yeah, the women yeah. had had. Yeah, some mm, researchers found that the females uh, tend to so you were actually providing but, uh, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and then the, those very successful female entrepreneurs are very active in uh, exporting their products to even the European markets and the North American markets. Um, I just have one little <laughs> anecdote I'd like to hear. Because you told me when we were talking about formal and informal mm -hmm. that um, at one point, I think it was in Ethiopia, you were doing a project and somehow uh, you were going to have the launch and mm -hmm. the minister showed up. Uh, yeah, Could yeah, you tell yeah. us the story because it's yeah, rather amusing. The metalworking people in that country was neglected by the government because the uh, metalworking <coughs> sector uh, repairing the machines are kind of the import substituting activities. 
So the Ethiopian government uh, listened to the economists, and so they believed that oh, export-oriented uh, industrial development must be important. So uh, import substituting sector was neglected. So the, those uh, <coughs> metal working people have never received any support from the government. But when we provided, tried to provide the training to them, then I invited uh, the state minister of industry to the opening ceremony. Then those, uh, you know, those who said, uh, Aria said uh, to come to the training program, just hide away. <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't pay the tax and they, there was a rumor that once they <laughs> participate in the training, they, the tax collector would come. So they were shy away. So. So, so maybe you have to give them an opportunity to actually move on up the scale. <laughs> yes, Kay, I was going to come to you for point. final year. The uh, former prime minister who unfortunately passed away, Mr. Meres, is an economist interested in development of East Asia. He knows how East Asian countries develop. Important thing is learning from abroad. So he has been supporting this Kaizen management movement in, in Ethiopia. Now it has, the, the, he has set up the Kaizen Institute in which uh, a lot of the, uh, people are trained about Kaizen by receiving instruction from the Japanese uh, experts. Yeah. And that is a very good uh, development. Yeah, when I tried to explain our training program to him, uh, in a kind of roundabout way, because I just assumed that he did, wouldn't know the word Kaizen, so I tried to explain. Then he said, oh, that's Kaizen. <laughs> 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 and uh, teach Kaizen to our people, he said. Yeah. Okay, well, what has foreign aid done so far? Or what's the record been in terms of um, supporting industrialization? Yeah, um, there are a lot of things. Development aid. Yeah, uh, the, the, yeah, development agencies did a lot of good things, including the provision of a BDS, uh, uh, business development services. That was very good, but it neglected the fact that business owners and managers do not recognize that management is very important. They do not know. So demand is latent. So in order to make them recognize the importance of management, we need extra effort to convince them that management is a key. Yeah, <laughs> management is a key. And then, uh, secondly, I think this concept of Kaizen, which was initiated more or less by Toyota, famous Toyota management system. Kaizen management is widespread throughout Asia. China, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, and everywhere. So that should be also uh, uh, transmitted to, to Africa. And then another thing is the importance of industrial clusters. Almost all the manufacturing oh, industries... Oh, you mean industrial clusters where lots of businesses come yeah, together yeah, like yeah, they related, did in Ghana. And the, yeah, the Manchester and the Glasgow uh, mm -hmm. in historically. But China's development has been cluster-based. There's no question. Japanese development has been cluster-based. And in Africa, there are actually many clusters. And there are a lot of good things within the cluster, you know, because of the proximity, transaction cost is low, and information is uh, exchanged among uh, producers and so on and so forth. But that importance of uh, cluster has been ignored in, in, in the foreign aid. That, that's uh, another shortcoming. OK, very, very quickly, moving forward, any, any last sort of advice, policy advice on what should be done, um, given the we audience have, we, we have, have, here? We have we have offered very rudimentary uh, uh, training programs. We should certainly uh, offer advanced courses so that their management will become much more efficient. And also, we should use the management training as a screening device to identify promising entrepreneurs. As uh, John Page said, if we have to distribute the credit to everybody, <laughs> we waste a lot of money because uh, if you, uh, many of the small ones will die in a few years. So we provide a training program. After training, it becomes very clear that who really learned new thing and who didn't learn. And by identifying the promising ones, we should provide credit, we should provide the infrastructure, we should provide the other services. Also, we should think about moving them to uh, SEZ, uh, SZ, SZ, the special economic okay, zone, yeah. in which <laughs> FDI is calm, because yeah. FDI is a major source of uh, new information. So, so those things must be integrated. So everything has to be holistic. Ah. But it also, I mean, just again, to, to be slightly argumentative, because I have to be, but it seems to me that in, in Kenya, at least, you were dealing with people who were considerably further down the technological and, and technical skills level, but still had a very positive result. So mm -hmm. maybe 
integrating all of it. Okay, folks, it's time to do a little bit of Q&A. I think we've got time for a couple. So do we have any questions for either Kay or Tetsushi on how management and skills training, I mean, Kaizen can actually help more small firms to succeed, to identify entrepreneurs, why it's important to identify entrepreneurs, sorry. Got a little frog in my throat. And maybe a little bit about how this can be integrated into policy. All right, um, Sam Jones, then Lotte Dahlman, and then Peter Samuelson, and then Soren Shu. And then I will see how we're doing for time. So Sam, you start. Thanks, yeah, uh, just a very quick question. We haven't really talked today, but you kind of hinted at it, the role of international migration. So can, I I is that something that development aid could be financing, is people to go to developed countries to learn and get experience and then come back, a bit like the Bangladesh story you, you told? Yeah, that's yeah. a good idea, but uh, it's very costly. It, it's cheaper to send uh, experts in Japan to, to Africa rather than inviting 130 Africans to Japan for training. <laughs> Cost effective, here we go. Okay, I think uh, Lotte Dalman was our next. Yes, um, I'm wondering if there's a need to distinguish between innovation and entrepreneurship. You talked about Bangladesh. It seems to me that the replication of, of the garment uh, industry idea, replicating it to several thousands, is more entrepreneurship than innovation. I tend to, to see innovation as, as a way of, of, um, of building new ideas and developing new ideas and new businesses rather than replicating one question. The other quick question I would like to ask, it's true that Bangladesh is a great example of how it's generating jobs and good salaries. People even, you know, they jump, they ship, you know, change factories to get a better wage. But don't you think there'll be a saturation point and then wages, they will start competing with one another? How do you see that? Ah, you've already covered that, actually. Uh, Which one of you wants to... Yeah, as far okay. as the garment industry in Bangladesh is concerned, we predict, we are very sure that it will continue to grow. The major reason is that China is losing comparative advantage in, in producing uh, labor-intensive products. Actually, we have observed a lot of Chinese uh, people coming to Bangladesh to make orders. And the Bangladesh people are very, very confident that they can continue to grow. Okay, Peter Samuelson. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, speaking from the Danish Forum for Microfinance, we are obviously pleased to hear that so much uh, interest has been uh, on the microfinance as a part of the solution. And also the BDS discussion is interesting. Um, how about the new wave of the uh, making markets work for the poor and the donor committee for enterprise development, which is so much emphasizing on the value chain analysis and identifying market-based solution to enterprise development. I haven't heard much about that. Yeah, uh, the, of course, value chain is very important. And uh, how to manage value chain is an important component of management. Marketing is actually the key. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, uh, enterprises, out of 100, uh, 100 top largest enterprises, 50% of the, the managers used to be traders. Why? Because trader knows how to market the products. And that has been the case not only in Ethiopia, but in China, uh, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and everywhere. So uh, thinking about the uh, value chain properly is a, is a key component of the innovation. Okay, Soren Shu. To the extent that management capabilities is an important constraint to many of these companies, um, what does that imply? Uh, because, I mean, you can train people or you can uh, try to get people that know this stuff already. So what does this imply for trying to attract um, multinational companies to, um, to developing countries to get these um, management capabilities? Okay, I, I think, I you know, my understanding of this is why train locally when you can hire locally? And I guess one of the answers here is because we're trying to figure out how to hire locally. But it's a question of uh, why create the skills if somebody has the skills? But if people don't have the skills, you want to bring them in. I'm sorry, Soren, that I'm answering your question. Uh, <laughs> I am very familiar with this paper. But is there... 
yeah, in Africa, many, many, there are many good instructors, and uh, also the, 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 those uh, the smaller business owners, managers, uh, had the very you know, limited access to the knowledge, important knowledge. But uh, the base, uh, now the, it, it's a uh, kind of era of the information. Then how can they be, uh, their access to knowledge is limited? Uh, I think one reason is that uh, they didn't know the value of knowledge. Yeah. So the, 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 they, they, are, uh, they have limited access to advanced knowledge because they don't know the basic knowledge. So they're providing the knowledge and then the, the more people can participate and then the, among, from them, there may be a very good one. I think maybe this is the story of development. Mm -hmm. uh, Morton, and then Johnny. Okay, Johnny first. Okay, on the Bangladesh issue, um, I lived there when this took off. So um, I, I have to say just a few uh, comments on this success. I'm sure it was a very big management achievement, but there were also a couple of other facts that made this happen, which are actually more contrary to I mean, normal uh, policy advice. First of all, this happened because Korean and Taiwanese and other manufacturers were running into trade barriers in Europe and the US, so they could no longer Im import to or export to those countries, so they moved their production to a country which had least development country status and were thereby granted free access into these extremely important markets mm -hmm. first. Secondly, this would never have happened if they didn't um, engineer a special system for Bangladesh because Bangladesh lived with a very, very high protection of its own textile industry. So textile industry spinning and weaving was heavily protected in Bangladesh. They do that because of India, of course. So there's no value chain at all. The produce was brought in from outside, was not uh, in the local weaveries. Uh, the, the trade was not even made in Bangladesh. So they did it via duty drawback systems and in special export processing zone because they could not produce cheap enough in Bangladesh. And then a yeah, culturally... You, you lost me on the last one, sorry. And normally if you, if you, if you make a jacket, yeah. you would like to weave the uh, material in a local... Uh, ah, you're saying they so brought all the raw that material so it was in. brought in, cut and sold, and then exported again. It would do the drawback system and an export processing zone, which isolated it completely from the rest of the Bangladesh economy. But it and still created a huge, a huge industry in Bangladesh, didn't it? Yes, because of regulatory things that sort of um, isolated from the rest of the, of the Bangladesh economy. And then a very special cultural thing in Bangladesh, an enormous pool of female labor that had not before that been sort of authorized to work outside the home. Yeah. There was nothing like a minimum salary. They oh, would I'm work for anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. Kay? No, no I, I agree with you, uh, <laughs> mostly, not, not 100%, but 90%. <laughs> but the reason why I, we refer to the case of Bangladesh is that pattern of development of Bangladesh is exactly the same as pattern of development of East Asian countries. So the, the, the same pattern of the development can take place in South Asia. That's an important lesson we should learn. Okay, 